Hi, Alan. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. This is my home group. And here we go with the doctor's opinion, starting the book off again. This is a chapter that comes before the first chapter. Uh, it's on page 25 in Roman numerals. So when the book first came out, Bill was writing, you know, he wrote his story, all that kind of stuff. And they needed some medical information because, you know, alcoholism, you know, they were finding out as a disease. No one had called it a disease before. They just said alcoholics were people who were maladjusted to reality. So the doctor changed all that. He had, he, it's Dr. Silkworth that wrote this letter, uh, two letters for the book. You know, he didn't want to say too much. You'll see the difference between the two letters. There's a huge difference between the two letters. Doctors, you know, he was kind of nervous about starting to talk about uh, recovering from alcoholism when it required uh, what he had found out from Bill Wilson is it required a spiritual solution and a psychic change. And these are not scientific things. They were not medical terms. Doctors had their synthetic knowledge, which we'll read about later, that, um, you know, they were all scientific. And this was an opinion that was not so scientific, but, but he appreciated what they had done. And so we'll read a little bit of this and read the first letter. So on page XXV, the doctor's opinion. We of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. So the first tidbit of information is there's a plan of recovery in here. We want to recover from alcoholics, alcoholism. The plan is in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction, gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. It says, to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. That's different than what it says in the uh, forward to the first edition. By just one little word, it makes all the difference in the world. It says in the forward to the first edition, it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Seemingly, because they knew that there was a, a solution. They knew there was recovery. The doctor couldn't really say it because the recovery involved spiritual means, spiritual principles. So he said hopeless. He says, in the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become a, the basic basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others have recovered. So the brief description of how they got sober was certain ideas passed on from one alcoholic to another and to their families, the families are included, and then they took it and passed it on to someone else. And 100 people got sober. When these doctors have been working for years to try to get alcoholics sober and couldn't figure out how to get them sober, and Bill figured it out. And they got 100 people sober in just a couple of years in the beginning. I personally know scores of cases 
who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. So the doctors were not being so successful at getting alcoholics sober. They were failing miserably. Bill got 100 people working together with them. They got 100 people sober in relatively short order. So the doctor was saying, they've got something. They've got something we don't have yet. And he goes, these facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men uh, may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, M.D. So if you notice, that's a pretty scant explanation of recovery. He didn't take any credit for it. He didn't really talk about what the methods or, or processes were. Just that one of his patients, who happens to be Bill Wilson, the founder of our society, Bill Wilson finally got sober after three visits to the hospital. And those visits were, you know, two, three weeks long. Because Bill was a bad alcoholic. It took him a long time to dry out. And so he had spent quite a bit of time with uh, this Dr. Silkworth. Finally, Dr. Silkworth realized that this guy that he had treated so many times and that was such a, a hopeless drunk had now been so, gotten sober, stayed sober, and helped other people get sober. He got Dr. Bob Smith sober, Bill Dodson, and on and on for a, the first hundred people that he got sober in, in really not much time. It was a little slow at the start, and then it picked up and picked up, and, and, and then there's a hundred people. By the time that this book was published, the first hundred people did not have the book. They didn't have the advantages that we have now, history of 80-some years of recovery going on, spread all around the world, millions of people sober, a book that we've had, you know, four editions of already. And, uh, you know, they didn't have any of that. It was word of mouth. It was experience. It was one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. So it was much more difficult than it is for us today. And then the book came out in 1939, and that changed everything again. So it goes on to say, the physician who, at our request, gave us this letter, had been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who had suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. And last week, the meeting was about the disease concept of alcohol, uh, alcoholism about how we have not only the mental problem that our emotions get us upset, we get all crazy, and and we want to drink. And we have a drink, and we think the drink is a solution to our problems. But if we're a real alcoholic, our body is different than the other people that drink. We have an allergy. And that allergy means that when we have one drink, it kicks in the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon of craving does not exist until you have a drink in you. It does not exist before you drink. So, 100% abstinence of alcohol would prevent the allergy from having an effect on you. But one drink kicks it into gear, and the allergy causes us this phenomenon of craving and we have one more drink, and then another drink, and another drink. And I talked about all that last week. And that takes us into 
the well-known spree, we come out of it restless, discontented, irritable. We have all these character defects, guilt and remorse and self-pity and anger and fear. All these things happen and we then drink again and just go right back around in that cycle of self-destruction. And it continues over and over, round and around. And that's what we that's how alcoholism is manifests in us. So the doctor said discovered that it was an allergy, that the body was sick too. And what that did was let us alcoholics off the hook. We weren't drinking because we were maladjusted to life. We weren't drinking because we were mental defectives. We're not drinking for escape from reality. We're drinking because we have an allergy. And once we have the first drink, we can't stop drinking. So it's not that we would rather be sitting in that bar for eight hours rather than to be home with our wife and kids. It's not that we'd rather be in that bar than be at work. It's because we have an allergy that once we have one lousy drink, we can't stop drinking. And when we come out of that spree and we get sober for a couple of days and we swear off alcohol and swear that we're just not going to drink anymore, it works for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. But eventually, our willpower, which is what's stopping us from drinking, gives in for some emotional upheaval, some emotional thing. We get really mad, really happy, really sad, and our emotions drive us past our, our ability to, uh, with willpower alone, not drink. And it pushes us into a drink. And once we have that drink, here we go, right back in that circle again. And once we have the drink, nobody can help you until you come out of that. That's why they put you in the hospitals, dry you up, get that out of you, get all cleaned up. That's why we have detox centers is because once you're detoxed and an alcoholic comes and talks to you, you'll listen. But before you detox, you won't listen. That's the nature of the disease. So it, it goes on. The doctor starts to explain that theory. It says the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that this, that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Why did we stay in the bar so long? Why did we drink so many bottles of wine? Why? Why did we keep on drinking? Why didn't we go home like every other customer in the bar went home and we stayed? Why was it like that? We wanted to go home many times. Said, All right, I'll have one more for the road. Well, you know, some nights I said I'll have one more for the road 20 times. You know, that allergy gets you. And when that allergy gets you, you can't stop drinking. And here's why the doctor wouldn't say too much. It says, though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached, as he has then a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. Uh, it's important that we understand what that allergy is and that the allergy, we're going to drown ourselves and soak ourselves in alcohol. And if, if we're going to help somebody that's an alcoholic of that type, we have to let them get sober. We have to let them dry out. We have to let their mind get to a point where they can listen to us. And then we have a much better chance. You know, so yes, take a bat off drunk, take them to a hospital, take them to a detox center. Wait for him to get sobered up and then talk to him. You know, you're not going to do any good. You couldn't talk to me. I'll guarantee you that. You couldn't have talked to me while I was drunk. So we have just a little window of time, too, because this is a repeated cycle of self-destruction. When we do go past those days and we swear we're not going to drink anymore, that doesn't last long. 
The book will tell us later on. We read it every night. You know, sh sh brief periods of recover, recovery followed always by a still worse relapse. That's what we do. We get sober for a few days and then we go back out and drink again. So we've got a little window of time to help people because they're going to go out and get drunk again. And while they're drunk on that next spree, we can't help them. When they sober up again, get dried out again, we have a chance to help them. But that cycle of self-destruction sometimes doesn't even have a gap in it. You go from one spree to the next spree with no break in between. I've done that a million times. The sprees last for months. So we have to, you know, really look for that opportunity and try our best to get a person where they're at a place where they will understand and accept what we have to offer them. We're offering them a great solution to their problem. But if they're in their cups, they don't listen. All right. So now the doctor wrote another letter. And this is a much better letter, a much more description of alcoholism and the alcoholic and the different types of alcoholics that there are. So it's very, it's very good. So we'll learn a lot in this letter. And this will take us a little while. So the doctor writes in the second letter, the subject presented in this book seems to me to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say, I say this after many years experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. And that was the Towns Hospital in New York run by Charlie Towns, who became a friend of Bill's because Bill spent a lot of money in his hospital. And the doctor, you know, got to know Bill very well. In the duration of his three trips to the hospital, he came in in bad shape. At one point, he, he told Lois, Bill's wife, you know, when he came in for the last time, he told he told Lois, like, this guy is... He's either going to die or he's going to have a wet brain and he's going to the asylum forever. He doesn't come out of it this time. He'll be done. And that was devastating to Lois. She had put up with Bill for years, tried her hardest to get him sober, and now it looks like it's too late. But it wasn't. And we're glad for that. So we'll find out how that all came about later, too. There was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when. I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in masterly detail in these pages. So the doctor is telling you that what's in these pages is masterful. This book is written so that you can understand it. You can understand the disease of alcoholism, all aspects of it, the physical and the mental, and that there is, in fact, a solution that is just a few simple steps to follow, easy to follow, no problem. It's masterfully done. Everybody can do it. It is not hard for anyone, and it's all inclusive. No matter who you are, you can get this program. That was a great thing. Okay. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. So this is the doctor telling you about his limitations to help alcoholics. We find out as we go through the program that we've gotten to a point where we're beyond human help. We need to find a power greater than ourselves that can restore us to sanity and bring us back to help. So we've got to find this higher power. Well, a doctor can't talk about that to you. You know, that's outside the scope of a doctor. That's not scientific. It can't be calculated. That higher power is in another dimension. It can't be calculated out. Everybody's higher power is different. 
their understanding of that higher power is different on day one and changes every day after that. So that's something that's hard for a doctor to handle because doctors are scientists and it's all calculated out. So he, he's saying our synthetic knowledge was not good enough to save alcoholics. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital. And while here, he acquired some ideas which put him, which he put into practice. Uh, practical application at once. That guy was Bill Wilson. Again, he's talking about Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson was in the hospital and he got some ideas, talking with the doctor, talking with Ebby Thatcher, a, a friend who got Bill into the hospital last time. They came up with these ideas that had never before been tried. And it started working, and the doctor was impressed by the fact that it worked, and it was pretty pretty awesome. But but it was still beyond his synthetic knowledge, beyond his scope. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here, and with some misgiving, we consented. HIPAA rules would not allow that today. You can't go into a hospital and ask a doctor, hey, you got any drunks here? Let me go talk to them. Because he can't reveal the idea that you're drunk. So that's not a way that we get to do it today. But back then, and they were worried about it then. They had misgivings, but they allowed it to happen. We consented. The cases we have followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men, as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive, and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves and still more in the power, capital letter, which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. So that one word, power, with a capital letter, is the first and only reference that Dr. Silkworth had towards the spiritual side of our program. Mental, yes, he'll talk about that. Physical, yes, he can talk about that. Spiritual side, not so much. But he realized that Bill was talking to other alcoholics and talking to them about a power that could pull alcoholics back from the gates of death. And it was working. They were getting sober. He couldn't do it. Bill could. He let them. And Bill saved some lives, brought people back. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. And this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. So again, we got to dry out. We were also, as alcoholics, were we not all selfish? I was always thinking about where I was going to get my next drink. I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking about where I was going to get my next drink. I was selfish. Part of the recovery from alcoholism alcoholism is to turn that around and stop being selfish, to be unselfish. That's why it started working when Bill told his story to alcoholics, and they in turn told it to others. So they got it from Bill and then gave it away to the next, and those people kept getting sober. So that change of from going from being selfish to being selfless, doing without a profit, Doing it just for the sake of the community, the think of, of the fact of the society, and getting every you know getting everyone together as a unit and sharing this message again and again over and over again, people got sober. That's what we had to do is set that as a bar, and that's what Bill did with all these people that he met in in the hospital. So moral psychology is a personality change that we have to have, and there's a power because our willpower is strong to get us so far, but
but not strong enough, not enough power that we need, that, that's sufficient to keep us sober. Our willpower always fails us. So when our willpower saves us, fails us, we have no other power. So we need power. And that's what this book is going to talk about, too, is where we get that power from. If our willpower isn't strong enough, and that's all the power we have, and every time we use our willpower to the max, it fails us and we drink again, then where's the power? Where's the power that's going to change that? That's part of the education that we get through reading this book, reading this book through and through and finding out what it says about these things. The next paragraph, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcoholic on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon human things, their problems pile up on them and they become astonishingly difficult to solve. Frothy emotional appeals seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. Frothy emotional appeals. When your wife is begging you to quit drinking, when your husband is begging you to quit, when your kids are crying every night because you're home drunk, when your bosses are saying, come on, you know, I'm going to have to fire you if you don't get sober. You know, when all these frothy appeals come at you, it doesn't work because there's no weight and depth to that. There's no real solution in, come on, why don't you quit? You know, I don't pick up a drink today. That's, that's not enough. They've got the, the, the message that we get that's going to help us get sober and stay sober and help other people get sober has to have weight and depth. So we have to give it that. We have to accept the help we get as if it has weight and depth. This power greater than ourselves that, that it talks about is a big deal. It's a big power. And that power can help you in ways that you cannot help yourself and that no other human can help you. It may be foreign to you in the beginning. You may think you don't want to do it, but it's the thing that's going to help you. The evidence is there. You will see evidence of this power greater than yourself, whatever you want to call it. It's it's a God of your own understanding. So it's nobody's God in a box. You don't have to accept anybody's understanding of God but your own. We'll talk about that a lot later in the book. But it has to have it has to have weight and meaning and power. It's got to change you. It's got to be enough to make it change your personality. If any feel that as psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics will appear, we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us while on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even their sleeping moments. And most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement, we feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing among them. So here's a doctor making the appeal to you. Listen to what these guys say. No matter what we've done through all the time, you know, we stood there and watched, you know, we watched people just die from alcoholism, liver shut down, they die of, of liver disease, just chronic liver disease caused by drinking, pancreas, you know, pancreatic cancer, all kinds of problems. And we all know people that have gone through that. 
and they get wet brains. Back then, they had wet brains. There's nothing we could do. You know, they got put into an asylum. They put them in state hospitals. They just let them, they were vegetables. The alcohol turned them into vegetables. And so these guys, Bill was able to get some of these guys before they got a wet brain, get them sober, get them dried out, and then share with them what they had done to get sober. What, what did Bill do to get sober? What did Bob Smith do? What did Bill Dodson do to get sober? You know, what did they have to go through? What did they have to come to believe? What did they have to learn? And and it had weight and depth, and that's what we need. But the doctors are saying, you know, what these guys have to say is something we can't do. They they contribute more to the rehabilitation of these men than the uh, than the altruistic movement now growing among them. So this uh, movement of Bill, Bob, Bill Dodson, the rest of the first 100, carrying this message one to another, passing it on, was something that the doctors just couldn't do on their own. And they were grateful. They helped them. They, they got them sober. They got them dried out. But then it was up to Bill and Bob to get them sober because it takes one alcoholic explaining it to another alcoholic. It can't be a doctor explaining it to you. The doctor doesn't have the experience unless he's an alcoholic too. You know, it has to be an alcoholic. They're the only ones that can actually get across to us the pain and suffering that we go through, that even understand it. Uh, it's important. So we're going to stop there. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the types of alcoholics. There's not, not everybody is the same. This is another issue that we have. Not everybody is the same kind of alcoholic. Some people are real alcoholics, you know, there's no doubt. Some people are not quite alcoholics, but alcoholism is a progressive disease. We talked about that allergy. You may not get the, you may not be born with the allergy, but drinking on a regular basis can produce it in your body and bring about that allergy. And then you have the allergy and then you can't stop drinking and then you become a real alcoholic. So we can stop that progression by getting someone who's not quite an alcoholic yet, real alcoholic. We can we can get them sober. Some people quit. We'll find out that some people quit if they have a good reason. If a doctor says, if you drink anymore, you're just going to die. That guy can quit sometimes because that's enough reason for him to decide to quit. But for some of us, that's not good enough. You can tell me I'm going to die. And I'll say, okay, uh, can we talk about it at the bar? So we'll talk about all those different ones next week. There's five main ones. We'll see which one you were. Thank you all very much. See you next week. And last week's meeting is on YouTube. I'll post a link in the chat, and you can see last week's meeting on YouTube. Thank you. Back to you, Alan.